Hi everybody and welcome to this Sunday's live training. So this Sunday's live training has been uh, kicked off. So the blueprint training, the signature coaching program I do at the moment, a six week course, this kicked off and on the week one, it's all about set up, setting up your company structure, setting up your systems, setting up your planning, getting things ahead. And a lot of questions and a lot of people's feedback is, and it tends to be, as I've been running these for a while now, is around limited companies, structures, group structures, how to structure these limited companies. I'm gonna do a little disclaimer at the start. I'm not an accountant, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a financial advisor, so I'm only sharing you with you for educational purposes, my experience on this. So you really need to go and get proper professional advice, but I can share with you my experiences, what I've gained from this. I'm just looking around for a book. I'm gonna give you a book recommendation, give you some good bits today, give you a book recommendation like one where you can study this really, really quickly. Uh, but yeah, it's just my experience on this. Always go and get yourself some legal representation who is a qualified financial advisor or accountant tax planner. But today's, as I said, is gonna be all around group structures. How, how you set them up, whether you need one or not, because not everybody needs one. Group structure sounds quite sexy. I'm, I'm, I'm the founder of XYZ Group, the Virgin Group, the 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 the, the Sugar Group, Alan Sugar Group. It sounds quite sexy, and a lot of people want to go into it for the fact that it sounds really cool. Even just having a limited company saying I'm a company owner sounds cool. And there is the odd occasion where a limited company might not be suited for you. We're not going to go over that too much. We're going to touch on that a little bit, but then we're going to touch on the structure. And I've got a group structure, and I'll show you how we're structuring. We're still working mine out because I made a bit of a mess of this previously. If I'm being totally honest with my previous accountants partly me partly them uh, and we're, we're just trying to undo that now hopefully you can see us and we'll get started Jeez, for any grammar police out there I'm a bit dyslexic so these these whiteboard exercises are purely so you've got a bit of a visual it helps when you learn when you've got a visual so uh, they're not for being grammatically correct so apologies in advance for any of my spelling I'm not sure how do you spell structure I hope that's somewhere near right so this training today is about setting up a group structure. As I said, disclaimer, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a financial advisor, I'm just sharing you, with you my experience. I'll share you this book now as it happens. What I, no, no, I'm gonna tell you about this book in a little while. As, <laughs> sorry to tease you there. So setting up a group structure. So when you've got to think about setting up uh, in property and now today, property is no longer a side investment. So back in the day, lots of people used to buy property as a bit of a pension plan. They just buy a property. There was a doctor, or a lawyer. They bought a property. They just they just bought it, and in years, it, the the capital appreciation went up. They had a bit of income in the meantime, and they retired with owning a property. Today, it's not quite that simple. Is property a great asset class still? Yes, hundred percent. Still, in my opinion, one of the best asset classes out there. But you really need to know how to run this like a business or partner with somebody who knows how to run this like a business. It's not just a straightforward invest, let's sit there. If you get this wrong, the tax can absolutely destroy you today. The regulation can absolutely destroy you today. So getting this structure correct from the start is so, so important. So what you want to think about is when you're starting out, you've got to think to yourself, should I be, let's get a pen that works here. Let's find the right pens. You, should, you need to be thinking to yourself, should I be, should I be, a sole trader, I'm not gonna go into all of them, you've got sole trader, you've got limited li liability partnerships, you've got uh, uh, you've got LLP, li uh, limited, uh, limited company, sorry, uh, LTD, and limited liability partnerships. You've got sole trader, you've got limited liability partnerships, and you've also got your LTD, which is your limited company. So the question is, which one should you do? Uh, at the moment, in most cases, the the limited liability partnership is the one you probably want to be going with. Let's find a pen that actually works. Is the one you want to be going with because the Section 24 tax, Section 24, has stopped you being able to offset your offset your uh, interest as an expense in your business. So in every single business in the land, 
Interest is a running cost of your business, so you can offset this as a business cost against your tax. So the old-fashioned way in your sole trader world, the old-fashioned way of growing a portfolio was you start over here, you'd buy as many properties as you can over here. So you'd buy loads of houses over here, as many as you can, until the lenders stop liking to buy to you. So once you've bought as many over here, might be 10, might be 20 houses in your sole trader name, you would then come across to here into a limited company because then the lending would become more easier. But the problem is section 24, you can no longer offset the tax here. So if, if you're not a high rate, if you're a high rate taxpayer. So if you've built a big portfolio, you're gonna fall into this quite easily and quickly, depending where you are. If you've got HMOs, you'll fall into it really, really quicker. So what is the consequence of this? And what's, what, what is the, what is the disadvantage of this happening? The, the thing with this happening is you're going to get taxed on turnover. So if, for instance, you, you rented a property for £500 a month and your mortgage is £100 a month, that £100 a month would be offset against your mortgage, where now they're going to, against your tax, sorry, now they're going to tax you against that. So it's made it very inefficient in the sole trader name to go... Uh, uh, to invest in property going forward. So limited company, and the government want you to be in limited companies, they want more professional people, it's easier for them to tax as well. So going forward, if you want to grow, grow a large portfolio, uh, limited company is probably the way forward. There is odd occasions where sole trader still works, and this is very odd occasions. Uh, I'll talk about limited liability partnerships in a minute. So the odd occasion where sole trader still works is, for example, uh, if you if you keep your turnover after your cost sort of thing under 50k this can work so for example if you had single -let properties in the north where they're only 500 pound a month like i've still got 13 properties in my sole name i moved a few out of my what i've done was i moved a few out of my sole name and sold it to my company which had to pay stamp duty and capital gains tax but i got my capital gains tax allowance moved them around the way i didn't pay any capital gains tax but i paid the stamp duty to get these out from my personal name it was a quick fix in hindsight i should have just really incorporated from day one because i wasn't thinking forward uh but the reason i've done this was because i bought my I bought my turnover to around 60k a year, but once I factored in a bookkeeper and the management fees and everything, I'm left with around under that 50k mark, which I can then be not a high rate taxpayer. So I thought, okay, brilliant. The problem is, as I'm earning money in my companies and building my companies, at the moment, I'm not worried about taking it out of my companies. I'm, I'm, I'm paying it forward. I'm investing everything I'm earning my companies back into my companies, into systems, building teams, into buying more properties. But there's gonna be a point I'm gonna want more than 50k. So as soon as I start pulling this out in forms of dividends, I'm gonna get destroyed on this. But some people might be happy on 50k. Don't forget, you might be a man and wife as well. So you've got 50k each, so you've got 100k a year. So if that's the case, you could be fine without the limited company because the pros and cons of the limited co cons of a limited company is yes you can offset the tax but the interest rates are higher the arrangement fees are higher the accountancy fees are higher so it's quite often unless you're building a significant size portfolio these the savings you're going to get over here is not going to benefit unless you like if you're a doctor already and you're a high rate taxpayer or you're you're a lawyer or your job is already making your high rate taxpayer limited company still the way forward unless you want to give up your job because don't forget you pay no tax when you're building your portfolio because you offset, as long as it's in a business, you offset the refurbs against, and as long as it's uh, revenue, not capital, and the difference between revenue and capital is, capital is when you're adding cap capital gains, if you're forcing appreciation up in capital, like making loft conversions or extension, that comes comes as capital, you can't offset that. But anything that's revenue, like for light like swap, swapping a kitchen, swapping a door, swapping a bathroom, is all revenue. So when you're growing your portfolio, for example, if you buy a house and you spend 10,000 pound on it, you've got 10,000 pound, let's say 9,000 pound of that was all revenue. You've got 9,000 pound to offset against your tax. So if that property's only earning 4,000 pound a year, or let's say 4,500 pound a year, just for my easy math, then you've got two years worth of tax-free income coming in from that, it's not tax-free, but you've just offset that. So if you're continuously buying properties, you're not paying tax, because if you're buying, uh, let's say you bought three properties a year and all of them give you a two-year window like of a of a, of a carried over ta tax, uh, you, if you carry on buying, you're just always gonna be in front of yourself. So you've not really got to worry when you're in that acquisition stage. When you stop, and as I said, in personal name, you'll get to a level of, it's probably less now, maybe even 10 properties where the banks won't lend to you anymore. So when you stop, you'll roll out, all that rolled over uh, tax uh, credits that you've built up will 
catch you up at one point. So you have to work out when it catches you up. Is this going to put me in a bad position? Uh, and as I said, you can use your spares and partnerships and go up to 100K and you might be happy living that. The only, uh, the only reason, another thing you need to think about with this is the capital gains tax, CDT uh, allowance is... Uh, it's potentially going to change not definitely but it's potentially going to change it so a lot of people get into property for their legacy and if you want to pass this on to your children uh it's set up in this form like this potentially your children will get charged a capital gains that tax the day they inherit the property so if you bought your property over here for let's say uh 100k and let's say in 20 years time, 30 years time, 40 years time, you bought it when you're 20 and 70, you retire at seven, or you pass away at the average age of 80. Let's say this is worth now 300K. And then let's say you borrowed an extra 100K against it, so 200K, which is a really efficient way of raising money. If you lent 100K against this property, you pay no tax, there's no tax on lending money. It's great to release money as you're getting older, you, instead of selling your properties, release it in forms of loans, and then you'll still have the income from it, it'll be a little bit lower because you've had a new loan against it, but you still have large lumps of lump money and still own the asset to pass on to your children and no tax on it because they can't tax you on releasing money. But let's say you've released it up to 200K. How it works, what they're proposing is, they're gonna then, they're gonna take this figure here when you inherit to your kids. So they're gonna take this figure here and say, okay, you owe 200K worth of capital gains tax allowance. Where in today's, in today's world, what they do, let's put this up here. In today's world, what they do is, they, when you inherit it across the day, they inherit it at the fresh start point at 300K. So any gains from that point forward, they pay capital gains tax on, but they pay zero from the day they inherit it. This is in today as it stands, but the new proposal they're trying to push through, which looks like it might go through, means they will pay it from this day. From, they will pay it for, they will backdate it from the purchase price. So if you owed 200K against it, there's only 100K left in it. So normally, I'm hoping this is making sense here. So in today's world, in this world here, let's go back up here, sorry. What you would end up paying tax on it is on the 100K. So you, inheritance tax, depending on the size of the portfolio, on the 100K, they would end up paying 40K tax, but then, then, then they would walk away with 60K in, in their pocket. So from this property, when you've inherited it to them, they've got 60K from the 100K that's left there. How they're proposing this is, they're saying, okay, you've got to pay, you're going to have to pay the the inheritance tax on on the on this 40K in inheritance tax, and you're going to have to pay 40K on this. So that's going to be 80, 40% on this. So you're going to have to, on this 200K, you're going to have to pay 40%. And you have to pay 40% on your inheritance tax, which is on the 100K left in there. So you're going to pay 40K here. And on this one, you're going to pay 80K. So there's going to be a bill over here of 120K for whoever you're inheriting it to. So that means there's only 100K left in this property. It means someone, like whoever you pass it on to, your kids have got a 20K tax bill. That's if you've got this lending structure. So again, in a limited company, it's very much differently protected going forward. So something just to think about. LLP is to think about if you ever come to incorporate. So at the moment, you, you can pass uh, share things to your wife without in, any capital gains tax. So as I said, where I own 13 properties in my own name, it's not as easy as me just selling them to my company. They will charge me stamp duty, and capital gains tax. And let's say I bought it for 100K, and it's worth 300K. I can't say I'm sending it to my company for 100K to lower that ta capital gains tax bill. The HMRC will just calculate what the market value is and charge you capital gains tax on that, not what you're selling it for. So you can't even swerve it like that. But one of the ways around this is, if you set up, if you're a partnership, you can move into a part, I can set this up as a partnership between my wife, move it into an LLP, then move it into a limited company with high capital gains tax. This is beyond the scope of this video. There's great videos with Ranjan and uh, Mark, is it Mark Alexander on YouTube? I'll put a link at the bottom at the end for a video that will tell you in more depth. Mark Alexander is a tax advisor, more qualified than I am. So I'm telling you just a basistic level of this, but check out the experience stuff on there. As I said, another disclaimer, make sure you work that out. So LLPs could work okay. The limited, the limited liability partnership. It's like running a company in a partnership. You can have a sole trader partnership as well, but these are the basic ways of it. So the pros and cons over here, you're going to get charged more money. The con here is you're going to you're going to 
potentially hit some capital gains tax issues going forward or if you want to if you go over 50k you're going to be destroyed on your tax and it's not just up to 50k all of it then gets sucked in to this section 24 where they 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 uh they they tax you on turnover so i hope that makes sense so a lot of people's cases are going to be limited company so now when you are going with limited company you've got to think about do i go with a group structure or do i go with just one limit company so this all depends so group structure let me explain my group structure and i'll explain why i set up my group structure so my group structure is i've got growth properties at the top here growth properties group let's do it in green because it's my color so i've got growth properties group at the top here then underneath I have my lettings company. I also have my uh, deal sourcing company, Growth Management. I also have a Growth Britannia, which was a JV. I also have over here Growth Developments. Again, another JV. But also outside here, I have another L LTD which I solely own, which is Growth Properties. This got done by mistake, but I'm leaving it this way. So this is Growth Commercial Developments. This is, I think I've got, I've got Growth Education as well. So this is my gro group structure. Growth Education, I've got Growth Lettings, Growth Management and Growth Britannia. So these are JV partnerships that were set up. I've got another JV over here outside of this as well, set up in a completely different way. Uh, this was just, we actually bought this in somebody else's names of properties. So this was bought in a sole trader because this worked, at the time this worked better. So this is my group structure, like roughly my group structure. So I've got my holding company here. So my holding company owns 100% of this. 100% of this, 100% of this, 50% of this, 50% of this. Me personally, I own 100% of this. So when we was restructuring, I could have bought this into this group, but I left this to the side. And, this, and the reason I left that to the side was because not all lenders like lending to a group structure. So you might get some headwind against your lending. So I've left this on the outside here. And because, uh, yeah, I left it on the outside anyway. So if I ever need lending in this, because we could have got this in here and it would have been difficult, but we could have done it. I'm not sure how, you'd have to ask my accountant. If anybody wants an introduction to my accountant, let me know, DM me and I'll give you an introduction to my accountant. I get no commission by that, by the way, but I'll give you an introduction to my accountant. But, uh, uh, I left this out, it, my account said he could have got that into the group, I left it out purposely because, as I said, just for the lending, if I ever need lending outside of this lenders that don't like lending in this group structure, I've still got that there to do that with. So what are the benefits of setting this up this way? So this growth, growth commercial development, we done commercial conversions, a split, uh, a split, uh, a, uh, uh, a title split and the plan was to do a bit more developing it's, it's 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 run out of steam the partner that i've done this with he's really busy in what he's doing and we just didn't pursue it any further but that said uh this was a plan to develop in here so what benefits would i get from developing if i developed in here let's say we developed a block of nine apartments or flats Let's say we, we develop this commercial building into nine flats. And let's say we wanted to sell, I don't know, let's say we wanted to sell five of those and keep four. With this group structure, what we can do, the benefits of this group structure is this can, the five will sell and we'll get, we'll get charged, we'll get charged as it stands, uh, uh, we're, well, as it stands, but we'll get charged uh, on the five we sell. We'll get charged. Uh, we get charged corporations tax, not uh, capital gains tax, which is lower than corporation tax. So we'll get charged corporation tax on that, which uh, twenty percent. Is it nineteen or twenty percent? I'm terrible at these things, but we'll get charged corporation tax. So then. On, on them five we sell. And then if we want to move four, we can move four down to here into our company 
and then I can move um, across into into one of my holding companies. So uh, where's a holding uh, investment company? So I can move it down into here into an investment company without any tax. If I done if I tried moving this prop if I tried move if I done a development here and I moved it across to here, I would get charged stamp duty and uh, capital gains tax allow capital gains tax. So I'd pay more taxes to move that into my company. So if I if I set up a company outside of this just to do a development, I will get charged that. Also, what is the benefits of this as well? Why not just do it all in one company? All companies have different SIT codes. So the the thing with a SIT code is it's set up for the structure of the company. You've got trading companies and you've got investment. So with an investment company, like buy to let properties are investment company. So this is a pro of this. With an investment company, you don't get charged, like a uh, buy to let investment company, you, you don't get charged, no VAT. With a trading company, you get charged VAT. So if these two properties were, these two companies were linked, these, you are exempt of that here. But if you traded, if you bought, a, if you bought some, if you if you developed and sold some houses, you could then drift into the VAT territory. So if you drift into the VAT territory, all your buy to let properties will get dragged up into this VAT area here where you pay VAT. And you can't then pass that VAT onto the tenants. So that's one of the disbenefits of it. Also, as I mentioned earlier on, one of the disbenefits of having these separates is that you're you're lending. So if these are linked together, if two of these companies are linked together. Banks won't want to. Banks won't want to lend you buy to let more products in a development company or a company you flip properties in. Is they two completely separate? So you're going to really eliminate yourself to people that's going to loan to you because they don't like them crossing over. So you re reduce your lending uh, op options with it. Also, when you're developing, there's some VAT VAT benefits uh, with this. If you sold, if you start trading, if you sell properties. Uh, if you sell properties along the side in your sole trader name as well, you're going to get charged capital gains tax, which at the moment as it stands is going to be 28% as opposed to your 20% corporation tax. Or is it 19% at the moment? I'm not sure. If someone could put that in the comments for me, that'd be great. As I said, I'm not an expert on... on uh, I'm not a tax expert or an advisor. I'm just show you my experience. Go and get proper advice. Just the fact that I, was, I can't remember if it's 19 or 20 percent tells you that you need to go and get proper advice. I'm just giving you my interpretation of this. So really seek out the correct advice. So this is a group. As I said, the other benefits from a group structure is with these JVs. So when you set up these JV partnerships over here, is what you've got to think about when you set up. Let's say you just you you get, you've got a JV partner. You set up a company over here just with you and the partner. So you've set this up uh, just to run as a company and you've set it up at 50-50 uh, uh, where you own 50% shares. Let's say your JV partner over here, uh, let's, let's say you, let's put it over here so you can see it. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be in the way. This, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take a picture of this at the end anyway and I'll put it in the chats below. But let's say your JV partner over here gets into trouble gets into trouble with his own business. He's got a lim he's got a limited company over here. Nothing to do with you. He he hundred percent owns this. Your JV partner. This is your JV partner. JVP we'll put there. He owns hundred percent of this. This starts having this company over here starts having credit problems. You are now linked to him, to his file, potentially. If this is not set up correctly with the right structure and shares, you can do this deal in a personal way and beyond my level of scope, this is something I like outsource to professionals. But you are potentially linked to him. So if he starts getting bad credit over here, you, that can affect your credit score. So when you're buying in your personal company over here, that could be a major issue, you know, uh, where when you set up your 50% ownership here, it keeps you massive, it keeps more steps away from anything. So when that JV partner, whatever they're doing, it keeps you steps away from them. Another benefit is when it comes to funds, some like like some JV setups, you might think, okay, when we've got more money in there, we'll just buy more properties. But some of them, like some of my JV setups, uh, all my JV setups, we're not buying any more properties anymore. So how do we now distribute them funds? Like if I, if they say this, this JV partnership over here, this, Let's put this in a different color. Let's put it, put it in red. Let's say this JV partnership, we'll go up to here, sorry. These are a bit crisscrossy. But let's say this JV partnership, it's got 
it's, it's, it's made, it's been doing well. We've got 50K worth of earnings in now, which is nice. If I want that 50, 25K's worth of earnings, I've got to take that out of the company in a form of a, let's try and get a different color here, in a form, to get this out of the company, I need to take this out in a form of a dividend. Then I'm gonna get taxed on that. Which is gonna incur tax. And I might take it out to buy a company because I'm not doing anything with JVs anymore. I might want that 25K to put into my, per my personal company over here or I might want it to put into my, uh, I've got a, I own this, uh, uh, or into one of the mine in the groups to buy. So I then end up, end up paying tax on the 25K and then have to lend it as a director's loan into my company. So it's not very tax efficient where if I've got this JV partner and we've got 25K into it, I can just move it straight up into my, into my group company and then move it down into this company over here where I might own solely or I can even move, loan it from this group company across to that group company a lot more easier. So extracting the funds is a hell of a lot easier. Move, doing loans, so if this, company, if this company earns really well, again, I can move it up to here and move it down to another company and in, move money around. Again, this is true. My lettings company has been running at a loss, you know, and this happens in a lot of businesses, especially in group structures. Sometimes, you, like the lettings company for me is more best beneficial for my portfolio building company because people know that we're going to take the lettings in house. And it's getting to the stage now where it's, where it's earning money, but it's run at a loss for a while. So say this run at a 10K loss, what I can do is where I move that loss up to there, also let's say this earned 10K, one uh, this year i'll move that up to here and that loss can be offset against that earnings so don't get me wrong these losses do get carried forward but it means that year so if that loss was in 2020 in 2020 i'll pay zero tax where if i didn't have this group structure what i would end up doing is carrying this forward and as two this makes money I, I, I don't I, I carry that fo loss forward so if i made 10k a year i'd pay 20 percent on that so i pay 2k tax that year so just leave 2k extra in my pocket don't get me wrong if we get this to a profitable state even if it wasn't set up in a group structure then losses just carry forward until you earn money and then when you earn money you you, you eat up them losses before you pay taxes but it's nicer to have that funds available in your pocket that year so that is an, another benefit from having the group structure there so these are all benefits uh, uh, of, of running it. As I said, certain companies, like trading companies, certain ones will have different tax allowances, different VAT allowances. Uh, some you're up to a VAT, some you can get 5% VAT on. Uh, and if you're planning to move properties around and develop and move things around, trade properties, this is a great structure to have, and especially if you're planning on setting up big. But you've really got to be quite big to benefit from this, you know? So, so I set this up too early and the running costs of running this massively get into my profits. So you've got to imagine, an average limited company running cost is about £1,000 a year on average. Depends what uh, accountant you've got. So imagine, if you've got all these companies, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven companies, then as a result of that you're paying seven grand a year so you before you even think about anything else just to pay your accountancy bills you've got around seven grand grand that year and that's not including all your zero and and your bookkeeping costs so the con of a group structure is the running costs again you've got to make sure you've got beneficial companies that will benefit from this if you've just got two trading companies and you don't want to move properties around and and like, like for instance, if you've got a rent to rent company and an investment company, you're not moving properties around from the rent to rent. You can loan, you could do company loans, you can lend from the rent to rent across to your company, uh, but put it on the balance sheet. So it can be still done that way. So there's not major benefits from having a rent to rent and, and a buy to let investment company. But you, you really got to work out whether or not you're going to get to these scales and do potentially developments and have stuff that you can offset. And especially, again, if you've got companies that have got losses running in them, you've got to then figure out like, like whether or not that is going to be beneficial for you. Your company's not, not run out of loss, you know, so there's no benefit from that gain there. You might not be developing, so there's no benefit from being able to shift properties through it through through there. So work, work out whether or not these these whether or not you're going to get into this area you can't the thing you've got to think about though is you've got to be realistic with yourself like a lot of people like my plan at start i bought a development site and i thought i was going to be a massive developer building hundreds of flats by the time i was here 
and my path changed. My main aim at the moment is my education company, and not because it earns loads of money, not because I want, uh, because of because any other reason, but I enjoy that the most. I'm always going to buy properties, so the money I earn from this will get filtered down into buying properties. I love buying properties, but I love this more. I love sharing. I love sharing knowledge. I love seeing people grow. I love seeing them expand. So my main fo focus is going on my main area of what I I enjoy the most. But if you'd asked me that 12 years ago, I'd have told you I'd have been this. My main focus would have been in development company today. So you don't always know where you're going to be. But also, quite often, what you see a lot of people, the one of the biggest failures of businesses is people get into business and the challenges come. And there will be challenges. And the bigger you grow and the bigger this comes, the more challenges that come with that. A lot of people give up before they get to the point of, of, of the promise of hand, you know? And it takes a lot of effort. So when people hit the headwinds of effort, they give up. So really think, are you going to give that effort? I know a lot, like our ego gets in the way. Our, our mind is not a, always a great thing to tell us what we want or what we're going to do because reality is very different to what our mind thinks it's going to be. So you've got to be realistic with yourself. But if you think you're going to hit this stage, a little tip is when I set up my group company is I left it dormant. And the reason you've got to think about setting up a group company from day one is because if you bought Say you've got a million pounds worth of property in this company and you owe, I don't know, 700,000 pound on it. That company shares are worth 300 grand potentially. And obviously the HMRC might work out on your earning earnings per year as well. That, that, that million pounds worth of portfolio might earn you 50 grand a year. So the HMRC will say, well, this is worth something now. So if you move these shares at a later date, if you set up a limited company, then you move these shares directly, you've got to sell them to the group structure so then they're going to say okay these shares are worth something so you can't just move them in for nothing for zero so you've got to think about it from day one but what i've done is at one point i set it up and then i just put it dormant and i'm pretty sure you can check with an accountant my accountant said it was fine but check with an accountant i left this as running dormant so even though these was all owned by these where it wasn't operating i run it dormant so you just dormant, dormant accounts gonna cost you 100 maybe 200 pound a year so uh, why if you think you're gonna set all these up Set your ones up, set it up in a structure, set up the ownership, make sure you get the your shares structure done correctly. This is why, as I said, you've got to think about your SIT codes and how you set these up. You can do them yourself, but I would recommend getting an accountant to do some of these, especially if you think you're going to grow large, because even the share distribution and the different share types and, uh, and, and also make sure you get the right powers of attorneys in place. And because like say, if you've got JV Partner, and someone's really ill and they can't make decisions anymore that could potentially go to their uh, next to king and that person might not be good at making decisions and you've got to think about all these structures and setups at, at day one so if you do it with accountants and specialists and tax advisors from day one it is money worth worth spending uh i didn't take this serious enough and why i'm doing a mess of that still to this day but we're pretty much getting there now with my new account and as i said i'll give you an introduction to my new account and as, as as well so you can potentially set this up and run it as dormant so you're not incurring a cost and then when you get to the size you need it you undormant it this is exactly what we've just done at the moment it's an undormented mine we're at the size now where we're getting the benefits from that and uh yeah and, and obviously because not obviously but because i'm making profits in some areas and there's still i've still got some losses carrying over from this one and even this one last year i'm not sure how well we've done because i'm this is my portfolio building service so uh so yeah there's always losses when you're building a company out. And, and again, especially on buy to let ones, you get the losses from the refurbishment. So it's nice. So if I earn really well, yeah, I just don't pay tax on it straight away. Uh, so yeah, the pros of it is what I explained there. The cons are the running costs of it, basically. The, the some lenders are, are not going to like that structure. Uh, and it's a little bit more complicated. So even the currency cost, everything's going to be a little bit more. So I think I've covered everything I want to cover. I'm going to turn this around now and answer any q and a's so if you've got any q and a's around this i'm happy to answer as i said another disclaimer again i'm not a tax advisor i'm not a, a financial advisor or an accountant so always get legal advice take this information if any nuggets make some notes on this then go and ask some questions to your tax advisor but make sure you get the right tax advisor the reason why i'm doing my mess at the moment is a little bit because I didn't have a, a property specialist, a tax advisor, but also a little bit because they're business guys and they screwed their business too big and we just got in a bit of a muddle, me, myself as well with that. So it wasn't just because there wasn't the right advisor, but you've got to get a tax special, uh, property tax specialist. Think of it like this. You go to a general practitioner, doctor, 
to get diagnosed or something. If you get they diagnose you, say, "Oh, we think your heart's out." They won't. They 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 won't do a by like a, a heart bypass on you. You go to a cardiologist to then do the scan and deep deeper investigations, and for them then to do the operation. So it's a general practitioner. Most accountants are general practitioners, and the difficult thing with that because they're professionals, they don't want to admit they don't know everything. But to understand, if, to read, if you read the full tax law, full code of every business, properties. Uh, uh, e-commerce companies, all the different group structures, all the different structures of businesses and different types. It'll take you 130 years to read the full tax code. And bear in mind it changes every year. So nobody can know the whole taxes. So this is why you want specialists in these areas. But also you want to make sure you don't get somebody too specialist for where you're at in your stage. Because some of these specialists will charge you £500 a month or £700 a month, you know, just to do your taxes. And you've only got two buy to let so only £200 a month. They're probably a bit too advanced for what you need at that stage. You only need Need really advanced ones when you get advanced. So start off with a, a, somebody who's got a property understanding, but start with a lower level tax account initially, and then build up to really, really higher level ones. You know, as I said, if anybody wants an introduction, I'm happy to do that. But yeah, as I said, recommendation. This 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 book, look, it's really thin. I'll make some notes. A little bit of a, a little bit of a tip is let's try and find one of my bookmarks. A little bit of a tip is get yourself some of these for bookmarks. This book, I'm, I'm a slow reader. When I measured my reading speed, and I read this when I done this, I've, I've done a, a speed reading training, and my reading speed is faster now. But when I done the training, my my reading speed was half. The average person reads 240 words per minute, and my speed was uh, 110 words. So I was half the speed, and I read this in the weekend. This was in 20. What year was this? 2016, 2017. This gave me a basic understanding to be able to ask. Intent, intelligent questions and have a basic understanding. I didn't want to be a tax advisor, don't want to understand that, I want to find the professionals for that. But the thing is, you sit in front of your account, if, you, if your account don't understand it and he just wants your business, firstly, secondly, he's not got the, his, his ego, don't want to admit he don't know about property, he could potentially just tell you stuff and it sounds reasonable because he's a, he's a tax advisor and it's not right for you. So I advise you to get one of these books, there's a, there's a more of a recent version, I'll put that in the, in the comments below as well. Use this as a bookmark. So then when you're reading, what you do is along the side, as I said, you put in little, like these little bits along the side, as you're reading, you've got this next to you, then you go back over it, when you're speaking to your accountant, you can, you've made the notes of all the little bits and you could literally just pull the parts out of the book and ask them the questions of what you need to ask them. Uh, so these, these are fantastic books. Just go in uh, on Amazon and put in Property Tax Portal. There's a load of these books. They're really, really good. Explained in pretty layman's terms as well for you to go back to your account and, and, and ask these questions. So let's see any Q&As. Didn't catch the name of the book. It's called How to Avoid Landlord Taxes. But if you, the name slightly changed. I think they changed Void and How to Reduce. I think they've called it now. But if you just put in Property Tax Portal on Amazon, you'll find that book. I'll put the link in below, Manny, as well anyway, mate. Uh, that's uh, interesting to have a group structure left dormant if the plans build a big portfolio into the future. Uh, yep, yeah, I was advised by by an accountant to set up two limited companies for my strategy. So one is for flips, one is for buy to lets. Yeah, if you're only going to do flips and buy to lets, two will probably be fine. But then you also think about your exit strategy with flips. Some I always buy flips that if worse, I like I like a plan B with my flips. So I've only ever done one. I say my flips. My flip was had a plan B on it. And going forward, if I've done a flip, it'll be exactly the same. I want to know if the market dips in between me purchasing that or doing the refurb, or I can't sell it, or or the costs run out of control and there's not enough profit in it for me to sell. I want to know it still works as a buy to let at the end, so I can buy every firms refinance it at the end so again if you brought that in your in your uh, flipping company and you thought all oh, right i'm going to hold this now you're not going to get lending on that very easily because it's a trading company and then if you move it across to your buy to let company then you're potentially going to pay stamp duty capital gains tax tax on it you can't do flips in your investment company either you know so so yeah you like it's okay if you definitely sell them, but your plan B is not there. But again, if you only got them two companies, it probably is wiser just to have them separately rather than having the holding one above that. But you can set up dormant. As I said, if you don't, if you if your flipping company is earning 30, 40, 50 grand a year, it's, if you ever try to put them shares into a group structure at a later date, they're going to look at what your earnings are and say, these shares are worth something now. This company's worth something. So but as I said, little quick reminder, read this. I read it in a weekend when my reading speed was half the speed. 
and uh, it's only a small, small book. Get generalized understanding. Speak to at least three tax advisors so you can triangulate the information because you might speak to number one. I remember, this is really embarrassing. I went to a business network event and I, I've never worked. I've never worked in a corporate world. I've never worked, should I say. I've never worked for, I've never had a job longer than three months. And most of them have been on building sites and in factories. I had one that was nine months, but it weren't really a proper job. It was with a plaster who was my brother-in-law and he used to go out on the piss all the time. And I used to turn up in the morning, he'd be walking home from the night out and we used to go in three days, one week, two days, another week. And that's why I lasted for nine months because it was very relaxed. I got on with him and, and it wasn't really a structured job. But every structured job, which was like, you've got to clock in at nine o'clock and you've got to leave at five o'clock. I've only ever lasted three months uh, at maximum. All of them, it got to about three months and I'll just, ah, oh, I've got this itch. Even though I didn't have no options sometimes, I was like, I can't do this. That just, that, that, yeah. like, that my why living on my terms. I, I have to be a bit disciplined on doing what I'm doing. But if I want to lay in one day, I'll lay in. If I want to go on holiday tomorrow, I'll go on holiday. I'm not going to ask any permission. That was a great thing with that guy with a nine month job that I've got that flexibility with him, but it wasn't. I didn't want to be plastering all my life and, and working like that. So I just went off and chased my ambitions of becoming a property investor and, and property business owner. But I went to a network event and as a result, uh, what happened was I'm networking people, meeting them, hi, what's your name? She went, I'm, P I'm PR and I was like, What's PR in my head? And you know that ego, you don't want to act stupid. And this is what happens with accountants, by the way, when they're telling you they know about these things because they don't want to feel stupid. They, they feel they should know. And in my head, I'm thinking, I should know this. Like, I don't know what PR, uh, uh, not PR, HR is, sorry. She was like, I'm HR. And in my head, a little script went in my head. Should I ask leading questions to see if I can work out what that is or should I just admit that like, I just don't know? And I didn't know. I've not worked in that world. I've never worked in, in business, like in the corporate world or, or in major companies and, and the the, the sites and the factories no longer than three months and never come across HR when I was there. And I just went, I don't know what that is. And, and she went to Human Resources and talked about it. She asked about how to set up a few things. She went, oh, you're really exposed. I went out a meeting with her and she's saying, well, logical. But the first thing I said to her was, yeah, what you're saying makes sense, but I don't know anything about this. So I need to do a little bit of research on it myself and speak to a few other people to make sure that's just not her view and what she's saying is not just a biased view, just trying to get my business. Uh, so you can, if you meet somebody you know zero about it, what they tell you can sound credible, especially if they are an accountant, they've got the authority and your brain just goes, okay, they must be right. So always use three people, triangulate this, speak to three people, because person number one you speak to might sound really credible, then person number two and person number three might then, without me realizing it, both discredit that first person, you realize, oh, them two are really marrying up what they're talking about, and it makes more sense, and number one don't anymore. So always speak to three different people, uh, uh, and uh, try and triangulate that. As I said, I'm happy to introduce you to my accountant. I've got no commission from this, by the way, so uh, like, I've got no incentive behind that. I think it's great, especially for more entry-level people as well. Even for me, where I'm at my stage now, it's fantastic. But I'm happy to give you an introduction to him. I'll put the links for this in there today. What giveaway could I give today? Uh, what could be slightly related to to this? What, which forms have I got put together at the moment? Uh, yeah, tax and raising money. If anybody wants a free deal proposal, I can't. I should have thought this before. Every week I'm going to give a little giveaway. So if anybody wants a free deal proposal template, uh, put it in the comments. Deal proposal template, and I will give you a link where you've got a deal proposal template, kind of linked to tax. It's just raising finance off the back end of what you hopefully buy and raise finance. You should have some tax bills to pay. I couldn't think of one directly. I need to think of a nice little, like nice little giveaway around the tax. But if anybody wants that, that that they they're more than welcome. Anybody wants my accounts details, message private message me, and I'll give you an introduction to him. And remember, if you don't evolve your ideas, you're never going to live on your own terms. Oh, I've got a couple of things on there. Good takeaway. Always good to go away and build your own basic knowledge to better understanding the professional advice. Yep, Steve said, very helpful. I'll be on the look for an accountant within the next month or so. Steve, yeah, definitely give me a shout. I'll introduce you to mine and I'll give you some preps. We're working together anyway, so I'll support you with that. Uh, Kane jumped on. Harvey, have you read how to use companies to reduce property taxes too? I've not read that one. It's an update version of this. I, I read a load of them at the time. I, I, I read, I bought loads of these. Uh, and as you can see, when I buy a book, I, just, I study them. The do's and don'ts of property taxes in companies. That's the up-to-date version of that. 
I, I had 24 seven property tax questions answered. I bought all of these at the time. They're quite expensive. They're about 50 a pound, but a quick read. But as you can see the date are from them, that was 2015, 2016, 2014, 2015. This one was 2016, 2017. And that gave me a generalized basic understanding to get my head around it. I don't need to keep on updating every year because I've got that generalized basic understanding. I'll just ask my accountant questions now. If I hear any changes in the groups and stuff like that, and when I'm networking, I've got a good base solid understanding. I did have a few more. I had another one as well. Where, what was the other one I had? There we go. Tax secrets for property developers and uh, renovators. So they've got a load of these out there. So can, yep. I didn't read the up to date version of it, but I read them around the time, 2016. I'm not that, I'm, I'm, it's not an area I enjoy. It's not something, I'm not a detailed person. I'm more head in the clouds than I am detailed, hence not even knowing 19% or 20%. So, but what, now I've got that basis, base knowledge of that, that carries me forward every year. So you hear about the regulation changes from the, the budgets and from networking. So as soon as I hear about them, I speak to my account and I've got enough of a baseline there, if that makes sense, Kane. So I don't keep on reading them, but you can do. It, it wouldn't be a bad thing to. I'm not, dis I'm not disencouraging that, just for me, I like reading other stuff. I'm not really that interested in it. The only interest I've got of it is I want to save my money. Ed's com uh, company really appreciate uh, your clarity. This follows our first session. Yeah, and that's why I've done it, Ed, was because I know there's a lot more, like, look, imagine, there's only so much like this fit in our three, three hour sessions as well. So this deep dives out a little bit more for you on individual bits. Ed, anything, and anybody on the remote, uh, the, the remote buy refurbishment mortgage blueprint six week coaching program, any week, if you want me to do the lives next week about something on that subject to go deeper dive on that, I'll do that as well. It really helps out for you to go deeper dive. A lot of these deeper dive stuff are also in, in your members area. So uh, you can find some more content around that in the members area anyway, Ed, as well. Lovely, said, thank you, you're more than welcome. Well, I'm gonna get going, I'm gonna enjoy it, my Sunday. We've got a garden guest coming over and the, and the weather's good. Azu, uh, I think I said that right, good stuff, man. Thank you, mate. Uh, Ellie, uh, possibly doing a JV with my sister soon, so this is really helpful. Thank you, Harvey, more than welcome, Ellie. Any more questions around that? Happy to give you some guidance on that. Deal proposal template, yeah, no problem. If anybody wants that deal proposal template, put deal proposal template, it's absolutely free. There is a, we do want your emails in exchange, so I'll be uh, totally transparent. And there is an offer after that. If you wanna buy it, you can, if you don't, you don't. But the template itself is absolutely free apart from we ask for your email. Kane, oh, nice, that's real. They are still doing the bundles, was trying to weigh up, weigh it up. Yeah, I think just one of the basistic ones to start with is absolutely fine. And you want to go into developing at the time i opened up growth commercial development we was going to do some development so i read that one as well but that didn't materialize as well as it did but I, 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 i'm looking at with some partners at the moment to pen, potentially do some commercial development so i'm not never going to write that off but anyway thanks everybody for joining us uh please share this with people you can tell people come and watch this if you think someone's gonna get benefit from it bring the love in get more people in there please carry on engaging how you engaging this as i said remember if you don't evolve your ideas you're never going to live on your own terms so evolve your ideas live on your own terms have a great day everyone